one of the things that I think gets lost um, with most investors is that they they don't understand what technical analysis really even is mm -hmm. um you know they think it's uh you know charts on a screen and squiggly line go up squiggly line goes down like my college buddies they're like oh gc nobody knows what you do that squiggly line up squiggly line <laughs> down you make all this money i don't understand <laughs> those are my college buddies but at the end of the day let's remember what technical analysis is technical analysis is the study of the behavior of the market right we're analyzing the behavior of stocks and interest rates and commodities and currency prices, as opposed to the goods and the services in which a particular market deals. You guys were just rapping about Apple, how they're coming up with products after product, greatest uh, you know publicly traded company ever, right? All that stuff, like it's hilarious. But what are you guys talking about? You use, I'm sure you use a ton of the products. You know, they keep coming up with new, you know, awesome things that consumers love. Yeah, great. But at the end of the day. The reason that it's the greatest stock of all time or the most valuable stock of all time is because it's been trending higher that whole yeah. time, right? Prices have appreciated. If everybody would have lost money in that, it doesn't matter how great the product is. No sure. one's going to talk about how great the stock is, right? So here's what I think gets lost. As investors, whether you're a trader or whether you're a long-term investor, in fact, technical analysis works the longer your time horizon, not the shorter your time horizon. So the longer your time horizon, the more important it is for you to understand trends. That's really what it's all about. Asset prices trend. We know that. Mm -hmm. They're, asset prices are not random, right? We have the data. We have all the white papers from MIT and you know that, that you need and Wharton. We know asset prices trend. Bottom line, a, a stock price that is trending higher has a much, much higher likelihood to continue to trend in that direction than for it to completely reverse and turn around, first of all. Second of all, before it completely reverses and turns around, there are signs of exhaustion that tend to occur again and again and again and again before the stock starts to fall apart and, and the stock market indexes for that matter. When it comes to technical analysis, what's my favorite indicator? What's my favorite pattern to, let's say, buy, right? If I'm looking to buy a stock, I want to buy a stock that's going up. The yeah. most bullish thing that a stock can do is go up in price. There's nothing that a stock can do that is more bullish than it going up. Because by definition, it already has a leg up because it has a higher probability to continue to go up instead of just randomly reversing and starting to decline. Mm. So when I'm looking at your charts, and I guess when you do it, you talked about patterns, but what what moving averages do you look at or choose to use? I know Ian talks about the seventy two day EMA. What are some of the ones that you like to use when you when you're charting? Yeah, I, I don't use any really um, moving averages. You know, because what are moving averages? Moving averages are smoothing mechanisms. That's all it is, right? So when you're looking at at, at volatile chart prices over a period of time, you could throw a moving average, a smoothing mechanism. To sort of smooth out that noise you could be a long-term investor looking at 10-month moving averages you could be a short-term swing trader using an eight day and a 21 day moving average crossover like there are strategies that incorporate moving averages but they're just really ways to help weed out the noises of trends or lack thereof in many cases when all these moving averages keep crossing over each other it's because there is no real directional trend so if you're going to put a gun to my head and say what, you know, what moving average do you like the best? I don't know. I guess maybe the 10 month moving average I kind of like uh, because it's very slow. It's great for longer term investors. If the S&P 500 is above, it's closing above the 10 month exponential moving average, probably not in a downtrend. Like that's kind of like one of the oldest, yeah. you know, uh, sort of uh, stock market um trend following systems that any idiot can follow is just, you know, own stocks. If it's above the 10 month moving average, don't, if it's not, you know, so I guess gun to my head, if, if I'm going to use an, a moving average of any kind, it's going to be a volume weighted average price where there actually is market memory, right? Because remember a moving average is an invisible line. There's no actual price history whatsoever at that line. It's just literally an average of all the other lines, right? Yeah. There's no history there. But when it comes to 
an, an anchored volume weighted average price. There really is history there. Institutions are following that every single day because it's the trader's job. If they're got to execute an order and you get a hedge fund client being like, hey, I need 10 million shares of Exxon Mobil, you know, whatever. And you got five days to buy it or whatever. Well, that trader is going to be judged on his or her fills relative to the average volume weighted average price, right? Like if, if they are getting better prices than the rest of the market is, they're doing their job correctly. And if they're, if, they're, if they're not being able to beat the VWAP, they're failing at their job, they're not going to get the order the next time. The other trader who got the other 10 million shares because they A-B tested the traders is going to get the order on the next one, right? So that's how that works. So there's real, and as you start approaching it, you start fading, right? Like there's real support and resistance at those levels. So I'm going to use a smoothing mechanism at all to probably be a, a VWAP. So, so here I'm looking at your chart. Um, you have an end of point for 3393, and I see you have a 1618 extension. Are you using FIBS or what uh, indicator are you using here? And can you guide us through how you would view this chart? Yeah, 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 totally. So these are, this is just, this is just basic Fibonacci math. You know, it's not that complicated, not to like over, uh, overanalyze this, but you know, the market tends to just, you know, show resistance and support at these levels. As you can see here, this is just a 161.8% extension of the decline. Again, not to get too much into the Fibonacci math, just a level of interest, right? Yes. It's nothing more. It's not this magic number. It's not going to make you millions. It's literally just a point of reference that the markets tend to respect again and again and again over time. So we, I incorporate them in my charts because it, it really helps. I mean, like, I'm, you can't like really deny it. It's obviously been a very important level here. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, and my suspicion is this 5,300 level is going to be pretty important one day in the future also, right? So we'll worry about that when the time comes. Uh, but this is a big level and it the market's inability to overcome these levels just reiterates that there's a ton of overhead supply relative to demand in the S&P 500. Right. But remember, it's not the bull market's fault that the S&P 500 is underperforming. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, people like forget that like stocks traded before 2011, like go back in history in the, in, you know, in, in the eighties, you know, all bull markets throughout history, the United States underperformed quite often uh, during those uh, bull markets. So just because the S&P 500 is an underperformer doesn't mean that it's a bear market. My graduates from my school, being Forbes, backdrop, backdrop, <laughs> a mic drop, backdrop, backdrop. <laughs>